It seems y'all like these, so I thought in order to milk this series one last time before the new movie comes out next year, I would go out with a bang by just pissing everyone off. I've already gone through the history of the turtles and how much I love this franchise, so I'm not going to bore you again. Here's how this video is going to be structured. First, I'm going to be ranking all of the movies, then I will have a tier list ranking each version of all the main cast from each incarnation, then the theme songs, and then my ultimate ranking of the TV shows. And before you ask, yes, this video was inspired by Jack's Blade and probably won't be anywhere near the same quality, but hey, I like just started gaining traction and believe me, I want some of those numbers as well. Cut me some slack. Here are the warnings slash rules for the video. Obviously, spoilers for literally everything. The only things I won't be ranking are things like the video games. I've played a lot of TMNT games in my day, but I certainly haven't played enough to include them. And same goes with the comic books. I just haven't read enough to make a comprehensive list. So yeah, not exactly ranking everything, but that title isn't as eye-catching now, is it? And when it comes to the turtles in the first three movies, I'm going to be lumping them together, but I'll mainly be taking from the first one. With all that said, let's begin. Got to say in all honesty, um, it's the biggest piece of dog shit that I have ever heard. Go ahead and tell me you're shocked. I don't know who the fuck approved this script or why anyone thought this was a good direction to go in. There's almost nothing I can say about this movie that would be original. It's just a painful, boring slog that does the absolute bare minimum with this premise and just isn't fun to watch under any context. It's not the worst movie ever, but compared to the second and especially the first one, this is just embarrassing. I mean, hey, at least they brought back Casey who just stands around and babysits the whole time. He doesn't really get to do anything. I hate this movie. <laughs> TMNT 2014 was the start of the live-action CGI Bay movies that were produced by Michael Bay, not directed. But let's be real, they might as well have been made by him. Do I really need to see you on my lap and tell you why this movie is complete ass anus? They were originally going to drastically change the turtles' origin with them being from an alien race and Shredder being some sort of mutated soldier, but I guess at the last second they folded and just directly copied the origin from the 2003 show. Megan Fox plays April this time, take a guess why, and the turtles were apparently her childhood pets, which does absolutely nothing and doesn't help that her acting is more wooden than a tool shed, or the fact that Mikey keeps giving her the horny eye. Can we please stop doing this? Oh, she's so hot, I can feel my shell tightening. We can hear you. <laughs> I'm in love. The only thing I like about this movie is the design of the Shredder and how overkill they made his suit. Other than that, this is as generic kids action movie as they come and I really don't ever want to watch it again. I mean, at least it still has this scene. <laughs> Out of the Shadows is the sequel to the 2014 reboot and it's not amazing, but it's definitely an improvement over the first. They add in a bunch of fan favorite characters like Krang, Casey Jones, and even Bebop and Rocksteady. Casey Jones starts out as a cop but ends up helping the turtles out by the end of the movie. I'm just gonna say it, I hate this Casey Jones. Casey has always been a pissed off vigilante that gave no fucks and just wanted to bring justice in any way he could. Making him a cop I'm convinced was done as a joke, or to give us a new perspective perhaps? I don't see it. This film is definitely an improvement over the first, but it's still not very good. It's like if you shoot your ass with the force of a bullet train and then did it again, both less impact. Where was I going with this? Get ready to take a trip, boys. You're going to Brazil. No! No! No, please! Anything but that! Secret of the Ooze is a very dumb movie, but it's so butt-fucking stupid you can't help but love it. The first movie was also very goofy at certain points, but trust me, you ain't seen nothing yet. This one has the turtles rapping with vanilla ice. <laughs> I enjoyed this film just fine, but it does not hold a candle to the first movie at all in my opinion. And that's not really the movie's fault, because parents back then wouldn't stop bitching and whining about the first movie, saying it was too violent and that they didn't like the swearing. You know, all the things that made the movie good. In Secret of the Ooze, the turtles can't use their weapons, so they have to use things around their environment, and they just completely disregard Casey Jones, and instead replace him with a kid named Gino, who 
pretty much just acts as a way for the writers to connect the plot points together and make it so that April doesn't have to do shit. This movie is honestly mid at best. Even as a kid, I saw the missed potential. We get introduced to Toka and Razar, which are basically this movie's version of Bebop and Rocksteady, and on paper, this is a great idea for a sequel, but the execution is just, well, kid-friendly. <laughs> But the thing that pisses me off the most about this movie is the fact that they bring back Shredder and have him drink the mutagen and become a super Shredder only to be killed off by falling rubble. We don't even get to see them have an actual fight. I am so glad the 2012 show took this idea and actually did something with it. This movie's still enjoyable, I promise I don't hate it, but in the end this was a massive downgrade. <laughs> TMNT is a movie you either love to death or don't care much for at all. And looking back, the weakest part about this movie is without a doubt the writing. The entire plotline of Leo leaving his brothers behind and then getting pissed off at Raph because he's just trying to do what they were all doing beforehand is so irritating looking back on it. I honestly can't believe I used to side with Leo when Raph did literally nothing wrong. So I'm gonna give you one chance to just walk away and stop this vigilante nonsense. You are all vigilantes. What the fuck is wrong with you? Not to mention the villains. I think the design of the Stone Warriors are cool, but they have absolutely no personality, and the story is just way too complicated for me to be invested. As for the stuff I still like about this movie, I'd say this film still has some of my favorite scenes and moments from this entire franchise. Raphael in this movie is literally the coolest motherfucker to ever exist, and I will never doubt him again. Michelangelo admittedly isn't really the best here, but that scene of him skating in the sewers might actually be my favorite thing ever, just because it's such a perfect character introduction. Casey and April actually get to do stuff and help out unlike in the last film, and it's also canonically the fourth live-action turtle film since it has easter eggs from the first three movies and starts with the narrating saying they already beat Shredder. Alright. The rooftop scene I still stand by is one of the best things to come out of the Ninja Turtles. I legitimately don't know which is better, the fight itself or the script. I mean, come on, what were you thinking? Don't push it, Leo. You can't leave home and come back expecting us to fall in line again like your little soldiers. Hey, I was training! training to be a better leader for you why do you hate me for that and whoever said i wanted to be led i'm better off calling my own shots now get used to it too bad it's held back by leo's awful writing but it is what it is i guess much like with secret of the ooze its problems become much more apparent on rewatch but at least this one also has some of my favorite things to come out of any tmnt film i've decided to take off the nostalgia goggles and unfortunately yes it's no masterpiece but hey i still think it rules <laughs> Turtles Forever came out to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Ninja Turtles as a whole, a new movie bringing the old and the new TMNT together. I probably go back to this movie like once every five years because it's so engraved into my memories just for how good it is. The only issues I have with this movie in particular are very minor and widely known things, such as them treating the 80s turtles like complete buffoons, and yes, I understand why they made them that way, but one thing the 80s turtles never were was incompetent, and they did get more serious and prove to be capable of fighters later on, but here they all act like they need the 2003 Turtles to babysit them. It also doesn't help that due to licensing issues at the time, they couldn't get any of the original voice cast, another thing the 2012 series later improved upon. Now don't get me wrong, the voice acting here is not bad in the slightest, but on rewatch it's very noticeable and distracting. Oh, and take a shot after every time the Turtles say what the shell. But those nitpicks aside, this is such a loving homage to the Ninja Turtles as a whole, Corel being the main antagonist and interacting with the 80s Shredder is hilarious, Hun becoming a mutant gamma turtle and getting to see a full-on adaptation of the original comic book turtles was all so much fun to watch. I highly recommend it, you will not be disappointed. I've already spoken my word on this movie before, but just to reiterate, I think that this film in its entirety is better than any kind of fan service in any other show, because the entire runtime of this is basically fan service. But what makes it good is, well, it's actually really good. They do everything they could possibly do with this concept, and it is just beautiful. The comedy, the action, the drama, it's all here. If you don't like this movie, I'm just going to assume you hate fun, because I can't see any reason to hate this whatsoever. It doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it anyway. For the love of God, watch this movie. <laughs> Everything I've praised about Rise of the TMNT from my earlier video is all thanks to this movie. Do you want to know what convinced me to finally watch that show? 
it was this movie's trailer. Yes, I'm being dead serious. Now, I was already aware of how awesome Rise's animation was when I saw this video of their final battle against Shredder, and somehow, some way, that still didn't convince me to watch it. But there was just something about that trailer that really, really spoke to me. I could not believe the sheer amount of hype I had for this movie, because I already knew how good the animation was, but giving that a movie budget, even just thinking about it almost made me have to change my pants. Obviously, the movie delivered, and it's some of the best 2D animation in recent memory, but to my surprise, the animation does not carry this film. This is like a genuine story with characters who grow, characters that clash with one another, that love one another. It doesn't shy away from more adult stuff, it doesn't pull its punches, and it can balance its over-the-top humor with heart-pounding stakes shockingly well. And the best part is that you can still enjoy this movie without seeing the show. I've heard from a lot of very credible sources that this was done on purpose because they wanted this to be able to cater to as many people as possible, obviously since the show wasn't that popular to begin with, and Nick obviously hasn't done anything to help it. So that's why we don't get to see other characters like Draxum and Big Mama outside of this brief shot. But as long as you have a basic understanding of how Rise of the TMNT works, like the turtles having superpowers, you'll be just fine. I don't know what else to say. This is honest to god probably my number one movie of the year. If you need any reason, any reason at all for this show to come back, I'd say look no further. TMNT 1990 is a childhood phenomenon come true. It reminded us of the 80s show while also taking inspiration from the original comic books. The costumes to this day look outstanding and it's just a fun, great movie. If you like Ninja Turtles, you will love this film. Raphael and Casey being the highlights for sure. The part where they spend time at the farmhouse preparing to save Splinter and who could forget Shredder's ninja child recruitment hideout and don't get me wrong, kids smoking and joining random gangs is not okay but they made this place look way too awesome looking for any kid in the 90s to turn down. This also marks the first time we've seen a darker Shredder outside of the comics, and the cinematography on him is just bliss. Did I mention that the action is also really good in this movie and the turtles can actually use their weapons? Couldn't believe it either. This is just the perfect turtle movie for beginners, and I think it still holds up to this day. I mean, it was worked on closely by the original creator, so that definitely impacted the final result a ton. Those incredible costumes will stand the test of time, as will the the rest of the film, I'm sure of it. <laughs> now that that's out of the way, let's begin the character ranking. I'm going to do this by taking what I feel to be the 10 most important characters in the Turtles legacy, obviously the four Turtles, Splinter, Shredder, April, Casey, Krang, and Karai, and giving them their place on the tier list. Let's get this shit started with my personal favorite, Raphael. Beginning with 1987 Raphael, this Raph is much different than later iterations. He's still a smartass and much more cynical than his other brothers. The difference here is that he has probably some of the best jokes in this entire series. Don't panic, Michelangelo! I'll set you free! Gosh, you're a regular a blanket! Which also carries over into the movie. There's nothing inherently wrong with this Raphael, but he's definitely been outclassed by future generations. This list is starting with a B tier. Moving on to movie Raphael, this Raph is nearly perfect in every regard. He gets by far the most attention in the film, and rightfully so because he's easily the most fun to watch, and his struggles feel completely genuine. He's more moody and angry than the other turtles, but that's just who he is, and much like the other versions, he still cracks some great jokes. I don't think it's loaded, kid. Now, 2003 Raph is exactly what most people think of when they think of Raphael. He's brooding, a bit of an asshole, but can also dish out humor when the time is right. Both him and movie Raphael go through very strong development, and they were always just a blast to watch. S tier for both parties. And as for 2007 Raphael... Yeah, S tier. I know the 2007 movie gets a lot of flack, but like I've said, this Raph is easily the best character in that movie. He's just the baddest motherfucker I've ever seen, and looking back, my guy was completely in the right. Now, 2012 Raph feels like the other iterations, but still different at the same time. He's very sarcastic and can be kind of a bully at times, but he does have his moments where he shows he does care for his brothers. If there's one thing I love about the 2012 Turtles, it's their designs. At a glance, they don't seem that different, but I love 
love the way they designed Raphael with the cracks in his shell, his Hulk green eyes, noticeably bigger muscles, and the fact he's one of the shorter turtles is incredible attention to detail. Not my favorite, but he does have his moments, and again, I love the jokes. I'm returning mittens to her owner. Are you an idiot? Wait, let me rephrase that. You're an idiot! A tier. Now, this was when Nickelodeon ran out of ideas and just said fuck it and massively overhauled changes to the Turtles and Rise. Raph is now a huge, gentle lug nut who is almost never mean, and as the oldest brother, he does his best to lead and protect them. I've said it before and I'll say it again, while I do prefer when Raph is more cynical, I cannot help but love this version. He still has good jokes and is very wholesome seeing a Raph that's just trying his best to work with his brothers. He even has to be the one to teach Leo the value of teamwork and leadership, which is not something you see every day. He's also easily the strongest Raph of them all, I mean just look at the way he messes up Shredder. Even though this Raph is still not my favorite, I'm shocked at how well they got these new ideas across without it feeling like complete character assassination. Easy A tier. Also to the people who keep complaining on how big he is, just compare an alligator snapping turtle to most other species, at least in that case it makes sense. Now moving on to without a doubt everyone's favorite turtle, the blue leader himself, Leonardo. 1987 Leo was goofy like his brothers but also had the the biggest knack for training and leading the team. I do think he can be a bit much sometimes, and that's probably the biggest reason as to why a lot of people don't like Leonardo when he's written too serious, like myself, but he could still have fun and had his badass moments from time to time. B tier. I'll be honest, I don't have that much to say about movie Leonardo. He's kind of everything you would expect him to be, which is not a bad thing. I really like him in that movie, but eh, nothing too special. B tier. 2003 Leo is the quintessential Leonardo for a lot of people. He can be very stoic and obsessed with training, but he's a lot more laid back than I remember him being, plus he goes through so much turmoil and development that just makes me love this series even more. He was still a competent leader, but I love the fact that he can still have fun and act like a teenager. This Leo is getting an S tier. I ain't gonna hold y'all, I despise 2007 Leo. I cannot believe that I said he was in the right in my previous review, but I'm now here to correct that mistake. He is one of the biggest hypocrites I have ever laid my eyes upon. That rooftop fight is still gas, but all it does is piss me off because of how stupid Leo is. I don't give a shit what Splinter said. You literally murdered people for petty theft. Granted, it's likely they were part of the cartel, but still. And more importantly, I'm better than you. No! No, you're not! Raph kept the streets clean while you were too busy humping trees in Brazil. If Leo can don a new persona and take care of business, then why can't Raph? Why is he the bad guy? F tier. Worst Leo by a mile. Fuck. Anyways, thankfully 2012 has a much better Leo to cleanse my hands with. I love that in this show, Leo's a massive nerd and wants to be a great leader like the ones he looks up to. I don't like him as much as the 2003 version because he can honestly be that typical annoying leader at times, but at the end of the day, he's still a teenager and I understand he's just doing his best. His character arc ends with probably my favorite battle in the entire franchise, the Turtles vs Super Shredder for the last time, where Leo ends up cutting off his head, only this time it's for real. He has by far the best development in the show and it made me glad I stuck with this series. 2012 Leo is amazing but he also likes his stepsister a bit too much so I'm deducting points for that, A tier. Now this is where things take a complete 180 from what we're used to. Rise Leo is almost nothing like the previous iterations. He's cocky, he's flamboyant, and hardly takes anything seriously, and that's why he's my favorite Leo. Okay, hear me out on this. While I think the 2003 and 2012 Leos are better written characters, there's just something about Rise Leo that is just so entertaining to watch. Second place, huh? What's that feel like? Yeah. Because I only get first. He not only gets to be the jokester for once, but he is also the gayest turtle we have ever seen. I mean, look at this walk he does in the movie. Look at the confidence. Look at the stride. Look at the conviction. This guy didn't come out of the closet. He broke it off its hinges and took it with him. I wasn't originally going to rank this Leo super high because he can honestly be pretty annoying at times, but after seeing the development and attention he gets in the movie... Yeah, he's earned his place as one of the top Leos for sure. Also, I love his design. He's based off of a red-eared slider, which is why he has those markings all over his body. And in the movie, they even start glowing the more powerful he gets. I just met it on myself. Oh my god. In terms of design, it's no contest. He is a bit much at times, and even though I do still think Raph was the better leader, this one's my personal favorite. A tier. Moving on to Michelangelo, 1987 Mikey is downright iconic. He was by far the most popular turtle and I can see why. He was one of the few versions of him that never got annoying and was just funny throughout his entire lifespan. And come on now, how can you not dig the voice? Nothing's happening! 
That old story must be bogus. The only thing I don't like about this Mikey was something that wasn't his fault. It was the fact they took away his nunchucks and gave him this grappling hook, which always confused me as a kid. That's a bit annoying, but still a god tier Mikey. S tier. 1990 Mikey is also amazing. He's excitable, he's childish, and has probably the best joke in the entire movie. I really don't have anything to offer you guys except for a frozen pizza. I don't even gotta say no more, I mean look at the way this man wields the chucks. Instant S tier. Now 2003 Mikey is much like the movie Mikey where he's a huge comic nerd and is actually one of the most skilled fighters on the team. The only thing I don't like about this Mikey is the fact that he's a lot more annoying as the series goes on, especially after the battle nexus when he starts constantly bragging about it, but he's still an iconic Mikey and got to use his nunchucks the whole way through. B tier. 2007 Michelangelo has a lot of the same problems as the last one but taken to the extreme. Outside of his introduction, he barely can contributes anything to the story, his jokes just don't land and overall comes off as obnoxious. D tier. On to 2012 Mikey, this version is adorable and his design is very reminiscent of that, with him being the smallest, having the shortest bandana and the baby blue eyes. He still has great jokes like the previous Mikey's and he's even voiced by Greg Sipes who you'd probably recognize as Beast Boy, which is absolutely tremendous casting. The only problem with this Mikey is that he acts way too childish a lot of the time and very rarely gets to have strong moments of his own. They also bully him a lot in this show to the point where Slash is bouncing him like a basketball on solid concrete. The only time we ever get a glimpse of his true power is when he uses Ultra Instinct for a brief moment. I wish this Mikey got to show off more like the previous ones, especially since his chucks got a huge upgrade with them being longer with blades attached, but as it stands, he's still a great Mikey. B tier. Rise Michelangelo is one of the most likable characters in the series, and much like the 2012 Mikey, he's very naive and babyish with him also being the smallest with the shortest headband. Plus he has these designs on his body, which I'm not sure if those are supposed to be tattoos or stickers, but I'm just going to assume they're stickers because he pulls one off in another episode. Another thing I love about this Mikey is the fact he's one of the most sympathetic and caring people in the show, but every once in a while he flips a switch and becomes Dr. Delicate Touch, which funny enough is anything but delicate. He becomes just this unhinged feral raging communist and it's just the funniest shit to me. He does have his nunchucks at the beginning and end of the series, but during the middle portion he gets this whip called the Kusari Fundo and uses that and his nunchucks in conjunction with his mystic powers, and it always just looks incredible. I like to think of it as his old grappling hook but making it actually awesome. His powers not only give him fire abilities in his chains that remind me of Ghost Rider, but also super strength with him being able to lasso things several times his size. If we ever get more of this show, I'd love to see something where instead of Raph picking Mikey up and throwing him like in the pilot, Mikey could instead use his chucks to throw Raph. For God's sake, I haven't even mentioned the fact that he basically becomes Doctor Strange in the future and even learns to make portals like Leo. This Mikey is kind of busted, not gonna lie. The only reason I'm not giving this Mikey an S tier is that him being overly empathetic is often what gets him and his brothers into trouble, and much like the last Mikey, he doesn't get to play that big a role in the series. A tier. Now on to the nerd emoji of the team. Donatello. 1987, Donnie is just borderline absurd in what he's able to make with random shit out of the sewer, but I'm gonna be completely honest, him and 1990 Donatello are like the exact same character, and he's really not that deep to begin with. So here's what I'm gonna do. Picture Donatello in your head. There you go, that's them. But hey, they were still extremely valuable to the team, so A tier for both. 2003 Donnie is more of the same, only difference here is the fact this Donnie is way more competent in his tech abilities and is just as skilled a fighter as the rest. They do try to give him a bit of a character arc and back to the sewer where he blames himself for the loss of Splinter, but they did not commit in the slightest to this and it just comes off as sad. But he's still an important asset to the team and can whip out a lot of badass tech. A tier. I have almost nothing to say about 2007 Donnie other than the fact I love how dry and sarcastic he is and he has one of the most underrated jokes in the film. No, I'm not playing hard to get. I'm telling you, sir, it's not that kind of phone line. <laughs> B tier. I'm just gonna say it, this is my least favorite Donatello. Now he's not bad all the time, and I do really like his design, how he's the tallest and lankiest of the four with a gap in his teeth, but he is way too much of a pushover and a whiny bitch for me to like him. I'm also not sure exactly what he saw in April, believe me, we'll get to her soon. He's still a decent fighter, and I like the fact this series gave Mikey and Donnie blades in their weapons, but yeah, I'm gonna have to ask Nickelodeon to stop purposefully shipping the turtles with humans, as if people don't already do that enough. D tier. Lastly, we have Rise 
Rise Donatello, and I can say without a single shred of doubt or sarcasm that Rise Donatello is the best character in Rise and the best iteration of Donnie by far. His tech is almost completely incomprehensible compared to his gadgets in the past, so much to the point where he doesn't even get his mystic powers until the end of Season 2, where he's able to combine science and his mystic powers, basically making him a purple lantern. These Rise Turtles are actually hacking, bro, I swear to God. His machinery is so integral to him that since he's a soft shell turtle and doesn't have the same kind of protection his brothers do, he makes up for it with a metal shell that doubles as a jetpack that also contains his other stuff like iron spider arms and like this flying seesaw or something. I honestly find it hilarious that when Splinter gave them their weapons, he looked at the smartest one and gave him the fucking stick. They made it a bit more useful in 2012 with the blade attachment, but compared to Rise Donnie's tech bow, it's absolutely no contest. This thing can manipulate and transform into almost anything the writers can muster up. You name it, a rocket staff, a big ass drill, a flamethrower, an M16, I mean hey, I wouldn't put it past this Donnie. He's very confident and incredibly full of himself due to his obvious superiority complex, which is very very jarring at first and can be a bit overbearing at times, but the fact he actually gets to be funny for once and is easily the most powerful and skilled he's ever been with or without his powers, this is a complete blow, absolute S tier. And don't even ask me why he's the only one with eyebrows, she looks cursed without him. Shifting gears from the Turtles, let's talk about the Aprils. Now, 1987 April is probably the most widely recognizable April. Her look and design is one that everyone knows, and her being a reporter for Channel 6 News is engraved into every Turtle fan's mind. Especially thanks to Byrne, who is basically her version of J. Jonah Jameson. Unfortunately, this April doesn't really get to play a huge part in the story, and is way more often than not just the damsel in distress. She could also be be very shallow and stuck up, but at the very least, this was still an April you could depend on, B tier. Now, 1990 movie April wasn't really that much help to the Turtles either. I mean, she's just a normal person going up against ninjas. I understand that she's just meant to be a supporting character, but that's all she gets to do throughout the whole trilogy is just being a supporting character. And again, can we please stop this? Yes! Ooh. Wow! A leg -rama. Yeah, I'll say! Hey. I'm allowed. Absolutely! Swing! <laughs> She's not a bad character by any means, and she does help the turtles through a lot, but there's really not much to her either. C tier. 2003 April was a massive improvement from the ones before, where she sort of start. She short. She short. She sort of starts out this. She. 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 She sort of starts out. She sort of. St <laughs> Is this so hard? She kind of starts out the same way as just a normal person, except this time instead of her being a reporter, she starts out as a science assistant for Baxter Stockman and can help out and sometimes even match Donnie in the tech department. She was very likable the whole way through and always had the turtles back and even Mary's Casey at the end. I really have no complaints. Definitely a nest here, April. 2007 April is more of the same. She's the one who convinces Leo to come back and thanks to her working for the main villain, she has a lot of knowledge of the threat at hand. We don't get to know much about her or basically any anyone else in the film, mainly because I guess this is supposed to be the same April, which makes it all the more confusing, but let's just say she learned to fight later on, and she even joins them in the final battle where she's able to 1v1 Karai. I don't really got that many problems with this one either, she seemed incredibly helpful and a strong fighter. A tier. 2012 April. Oh god. Yeah, let's cut this shit, this is a D tier. She's not absolutely egregious or anything, she does get better over the course of the show and not only learns ninjutsu but also gets powers of her own, which I always thought was really cool since it reminded me of Gwen from Ben 10 when she got her powers. But the cons of this April, oh my god, the cons. I'll protect you, April! Protect yourself! April! Oh. Great. Saved by wrath. I'm never gonna live this down. Like, bitch, I could just leave you. I understand she's a teenager, I really do, but not only is she incredibly irritating, but just kept playing with Donnie's emotions to the point where I couldn't stand her. I'm not advocating for human turtle relationships, but if you're gonna do it, then fucking commit. D tier. Alright, now that I've cleansed my sins of the last April, let's talk about the undisputed best 
rise April. I've said it before and I'll say it again, she's easily my favorite April. She's also a teenager like the last one, except she's actually not a stuck-up brat. Wow, what a revelation. We don't even get to see how she met the Turtles and Rise. She's just there from the first episode and very much acts like their sister. Her relationship with Splinter is super funny and wholesome, and I love the fact she's just good friends with Donnie. It's not gonna stop people from shipping them, but hey, what are you gonna do? I'm not a big fan of her catchphrase just being her saying her own name, but other than that, she's fantastic and learns how to fight better over time thanks to Splinter. And with the help of a mystic bat and her becoming a stand user for Karai, she's even able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Shredder himself. I also love that they hit a nice middle ground with her being a reporter for her school trying to expose stuff like in the movie. Over the years, they just kind of gave up on trying to make April a reporter, but to me, this was a very smart compromise. Best April by a mile, S tier. And now we have everyone's favorite sensei, Master Splinter slash Hamato Yoshi slash Lujitsu slash Splints. He has a lot of names in Rise. 1987 Splinter is exactly what you'd expect him to be like. He can be very wise when it's needed, and he really does come off as a true teacher of ninjutsu. The only issue with this Splinter is that he's very stationary for the most part and rarely helps the turtles on their missions. But when he is needed, you best believe he'll come to their aid. This also marks the first major change to his origin from the comics, where instead of him being a rat that mimics the skills of Hamato Yoshi, he is Hamato Yoshi and transforms along with the turtles. And I gotta say, I like this origin way better. I know it's not comic accurate, and believe me, all of this is completely nonsensical, but I'm sorry, I f just find it more believable for him to be a master turned rat as opposed to a rat that learned kung fu in a cage and then found the turtles. B tier. 1990 Splinter was when they first went with the true comic origin, which looks ridiculous even by this movie's standards, and after the first movie, it becomes very apparent that he isn't super inclined to get off his fat fucking ass. But hey, he is still very wise and gives some absolutely enthralling lessons. Sometimes you must dig deep down, look within yourself, and ask why is it you have zero drip and no bitches, Raphael. But let's be honest, the best thing about this Splinter is how funny he can be. In the first movie, he constantly looks like he's nutting on himself, which definitely adds to the comedy even further. B tier. 2003 Splinter is definitely one of the best. He can still have his funny moments while also being a great teacher and father. Plus, he's way more hands-on with the turtles and their missions. He's not the funniest or the wisest Splinter ever, but hey, he gets the job done for sure. A tier. The 2007 movie I said is supposed to be canon to the original trilogy, but these definitely are are not the same Splinter because he's actually able to move around and nowhere near as wise as his counterparts. This Splinter is really just kind of unremarkable. He doesn't really stand on his own and aside from this great ongoing joke about him being addicted to reality couple shows, he's just another Splinter that doesn't have anything on the others unfortunately. C tier. 2012 Splinter on the other hand is simply built different. Scratch that, he's built perfectly. He's the tallest he's ever been and even the colors of his fur are so well designed. And he also has easily my favorite origin story of him. Like I've said, I much prefer him when he's a human, and his conflict with the Shredder and how their love for Tang Shen tore them apart is handled exquisitely. Splinter is just as powerful as Shredder, and their conflict with each other is probably the best in any of the shows. I mean, even when Shredder got mutated, Splinter was still clapping back before... well... I'll go into this more later, but this is probably the strongest example as to why this show's as good as it is. I love that they killed Splinter. Okay, I know that sounds messed up, but it makes for such a strong emotional investment I haven't felt in TMNT since it happened. Plus, it paves the way for Leo killing Shredder, and after Season 4, Splinter still lives on through visions of his teachings. I don't know what else to say other than S tier all fucking day. Now, when it comes to Rise Splinter, you'll notice quickly how far they were willing to stray from the normal source material. But in this case, I think it really works. In this universe, Hamato Yoshi left the Hamato clan and went on to pursue a dream as a movie star like Jackie Chan named Lu Jitsu. And after a series of events, he gets captured by Baram Draxum, and that's when him and the turtles get mutated and start a new life together. There's no love triangle and there's no Karai, at least not at first. And it's very clear from the start that this splinter is not as wise as he usually is. He only refers to the turtles by their colors and just sits around for most of season one. But then once he picks his fat ass up and starts contributing to the story, we get to see more and more layers of his character being peeled back, like with the backstory of his mom and his life in show business. But even then, he makes it super clear he wouldn't have it any other way and would go to the ends of the earth to save his sons. And since the turtles were partially mutated using his human DNA, that 
technically makes him their biological father, which is a first in the franchise. I don't think anyone expected the development this man would receive, but it was absolutely beautiful to watch. And do not let this short slab of meat fool you. He can easily decimate all four of the turtles at once and even Nox drags him on his ass at one point. This splinter definitely doesn't start out as what we're used to, but I love the fact that he starts out flawed just like the turtles and gets incrementally better along with them. And as with most characters in Rise, he can be absolutely hysterical. A tier. Next up, we have the god with the hockey mask himself, Casey Jones. 1997 Casey isn't a primary mainstay like the other Casey's and doesn't really go any deeper than wanting to stop criminals and break shit. He has a very raspy and foreboding voice and he never takes off his mask. He's definitely not the best Casey since there just isn't a lot to him, but it's hilarious how extra he is and how strong they make him out to be. B tier. Now, movie Casey isn't very deep or complex either, but he makes up for it with a lot more personality in the fact he's able to completely eviscerate his opponents with something no one would ever think to use a cricket bat. His power stems from his weapons, and once he's armed, you might as well tuck your dick between your butt cheeks and skedaddle because it's already over. A tier. 2003 Casey is very reminiscent of movie Casey, except this time he actually has a backstory, and for a lot of people, this is the most iconic Casey with his blue hair and massive gains. He's one of the turtle's strongest allies and even marries April later on in the final season. He's just an all-around fun and likable character, and he's also the one that pioneered the catchphrase Goongala. S tier. 2003 Casey voiced by Chris Evans is just kind of whatever if I'm being honest. He is very chill, there's nothing I outright dislike about him. I will say I adore the relationship between him and Raph. Since they skip the origins for all the characters, they just act like longtime best friends and it's really fun to see. Besides that, I don't really got much else to say. He's alright. I like him. B tier. 2012 Casey voiced by Josh Peck was when they started taking different approaches to him. Now he's a punk teenager that's somehow skinnier than I am and his arsenal got a huge upgrade with rollerblades, explosive pucks, and even shock gloves. I really like the way this Casey fights and how he's even able to keep up in battle against Shredder, but if I'm being real, he can be kind of irritating at times and the whole thing with Donnie and April is just <sighs> B tier. Rise Casey, oh god, where do I begin? It starts out with a character named Cassandra who mainly goes by Foot Recruit and in the last episode is revealed to be this series Casey. However, as we all know, in the Rise movie, her son Casey travels back to the past future trunk style, and that's how he fits in. If you want to know where I'd rank Cassandra, I think she's an amazing character, I love how spastic and energetic she is, and I honestly like the idea of Casey being on the dark side, then later on becoming a vigilante, as we see in the Rise movie where she has the hockey mask. I really like Cassandra, but it's obvious they wanted to do more with her and couldn't really flesh her out in the time they were given due to the episode slash that the show had to endure. If they gave her a proper arc, I would be over the moon with her, but as it stands, she's still one of my personal favorite parts of Rise. A tier. And as for her son, the actual Casey, I love his design with the tattered clothes, the cape, and the chainsaw hockey stick, not to mention his mask that has Leo's marking since he was his master in Casey's time. This Casey is just a very likable and sympathetic dude. However, much like his mother, we don't really get the time to delve into his character. We only get brief comments about his time in the apocalypse when I feel we could have used way more downtime with him. If I'm being real, I think this scene between Leo and him should have gone on a lot longer. Maybe tell us what happened to Raph and Donnie. It's not majorly necessary, but I for sure think we could have used more time for us to get to know him. If we ever get more seasons of this show, we must spend more time with Cassandra and Casey. They absolutely deserve it. A tier. Now, there's no such thing as a TMNT without the Shredder, and when going over 80s Shredder, him compared to his comic counterpart is downright unholy. But you can't hate this Shredder, you just can't. This man is an absolute riot. He's still a skilled fighter and did prove to be an admirable foe for the Turtles on many occasions. However, they made him into a joke for the majority of the series' run, to the point where that's just how we see this character now. Plus, 2003 Shredder ends up bitching him around in Turtles Forever. But with all that said, he's still super funny and has earned his place as one of the most iconic 80s villains of all time. A tier. And as for Movie Shredder, this is where things got darker and also somehow dumber. I think they do a great job making him intimidating in the first movie due to the excellent cinematography, and he could easily take out all the turtles by himself, at least until Splinter came along and Casey being the absolute menace he is crushes him in a garbage truck. However, he is still alive in the second movie and only fights the turtles once he gets the mutagen and just dies. So let me get this straight, he can survive an active garbage truck in his base form, but in his super form, his one weakness was faulty lumber. It 
It's fucking genius. Even in the first movie where he was at his most menacing, it's very unclear what exactly his plan is. Like, he sort of steals things and somehow thinks he's gonna take over the world with an army of ninja teenagers. Honestly, I think I've met dementia patients who have thought things through more. This Shredder is good, but has definitely been outclassed by future variants. Although I will say he gets an entire bump up because of the fucking head turn he always does that makes me laugh every single time without fail. B tier. Oh boy, now we're talking. Let's cut the bullshit right away. This Shredder's design is impeccable, phenomenal, absolutely sensational. My personal favorite suit of his is from Turtles Forever, and even Cyber Shredder goes hard as well. But even though this Shredder had probably the best design and voice for the character, he doesn't really have much depth to him, but he's also not evil enough to where it doesn't really matter. You can get away with characters not having a super interesting backstory by either making them really funny or a complete menace like Frieza, for example. Unfortunately, he's just kind of, well, evil. And what's his goal? One that nobody's heard before? At first, we think the Shredder is Oroku Saki, but he only becomes the main villain in Season 5, along with Karai, who took up the mantle for a short time. The true Shredder of this series is an alien Utram named Karel. I never disliked this change. I can see the thought behind a sadistic Utram slash Krang outcast using the Shredder name to build an army, but like most people, I do much prefer him as a human. He may not be the best Shredder out there, but he had easily the best look and was most certainly a force to be reckoned with. A tier. 2012 Shredder hits almost every note for me. Oroku Saki is back to being the one and only Shredder, and his backstory with Splinter and Tang Shen is easily my favorite origin for the both of them. This Shredder is a very tragic and broken man. You can see it on his face. Hell, you can practically taste it. Out of all the Shredders, he has easily the most character. But even outside of all of that, this Shredder had that dog in him. Not only being able to solo all the turtles at the same time, but constantly go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Splinter, and not only surviving a fight against Leatherhead, but slumping him as well. And that wasn't even his final form! His look in the show is still great, but what really gets my baby batter brewing is the fact they gave him these big-ass motherfucking retractable blades on his wrists, which is something I've wanted them to do for years. Like, why does this walking kitchen appliance only get to use these sorry-ass pocket knives on his hand? This right here, that's that good shit. But we're still not done because he eventually becomes Super Shredder, a first for any of the cartoons, and let's just say, when this happened and what followed from it is why I fell in love with this show. S tier, no questions asked. And as for Rise Shredder, this thing is fucking horrifying. In this show, Oroku Saki was an ancestor of Splinter who led the Foot Clan, but then everything changed when the Krang Nation attacked, in which Oroku made a deal resulting in him obtaining this armor which corrupted him and made him into what you see now. Throughout the first season, the villains are collecting these pieces of what they call the dark armor. Draxum is the first to don it, but then it steals his life force and that's when the real Shredder steps onto the scene. This is easily the strongest Shredder we've ever had, probably in order to keep up with the new superpowered turtles, and all of that is great. The problem is, just like in the case of Casey, we don't get to spend a lot of time with him. Hell, he doesn't even get to speak until the last couple of episodes. He's more of a force of nature than a smart, cunning antagonist, and surprisingly enough, making him technically related to the turtles doesn't make the connection any stronger. He only really wants Splinter and Karai for the sake of becoming more powerful, and while I love this design and how formidable he is, he is not a Rokusaki, it's a demon possessing him, which could be interesting, but again, they just didn't have time to go into his character, and unfortunately the same is going to apply for his daughter. It's sad I can feel they wanted to spend more time building up the Shredder, at least in terms of his human side, but as it stands, I can't put him very high on the list. He gets B tier, but only because he gets major style points. And what better way to follow up Shredder than with his daughter, Kurai. Making her first series appearance in the 2003 show, this Kurai is a very interesting character. She's a person torn between her love for her father and being an honorable ninja. She even takes his place for a short amount of time in the series. I don't really have any major issues with her in particular, I just find her to be very intriguing due to the gray line she constantly has to tap dance on. But later on, she becomes a more reliable friend to the Turtles and even attends April's wedding. She does go back to helping her father from time to time, but she'll always side more with the turtles and even save them from eternal demise in Turtles Forever, which has, in my opinion, her best look in the show. A tier. 2007 Karai is a strange case. I don't dislike her or anything, but her inclusion just feels strange. They treat this character like we're supposed to know everything about her, even though she wasn't in any of the previous movies. Honest to god, this film is probably the most confusing continuity of all time, and it doesn't help that this movie Shredder is already dead. She's a cool character and I like her design, but there's just really not that much to talk about here. C tier. 2012 Karai is the one I'm the most familiar with. Not only does she have, in my opinion, the best look she's ever had, but even 
easily the best backstory with Shredder kidnapping and raising her to be evil, not knowing until later that Splinter is her real father. I love the arc she goes through and she is one of the most sympathetic and strongest characters in the show. I could do without all of this, but I still really like her. A tier. Oh, and she also becomes a snake mutant which she can change in and out of. Pro probably should have mentioned that. Tell me if you've heard this one before. The Rise version of this character is incredibly different. In this incarnation, Karai sealed herself away in order to hold back her father's possession, but then the turtles accidentally pull her out, which is what causes the Shredder to regain actual thought. She's the grandmother of Splinter and the turtles, and for the short time we spend with her, she is a complete and utter delight. She has probably the most wholesome moment in the entire show involving the turtles. Plus, she herself is a ninjutsu master, being able to tap into this insane power that the turtles use to get their mystic abilities back. The sad part is, is that much like with almost every other Rise character on this list, we don't get to spend much time with her or learn about her as a person, which makes it even more frustrating that they had to axe her off. She does end up possessing April, and once they defeat the Shredder, she reunites with her father and destroys the dark armor, but I really wish we got to see more of this cry. I understand that not every character needs to have 40 layers of deep psychological trauma, but I just can't give her a super high score, especially since we only got to know her for an episode. I know it hurts, but it is what it is it is. B tier. And last, but most certainly not least, the Ping Blob himself, Krang. 1987 Krang is more or less like a nagging housewife to Shredder, but even saying that, their dynamic is without a doubt one of the best parts of the original cartoon. He was only really a strong force in certain episodes, especially when he would grow his suit like an episode of Power Rangers, but without his armor, he just wasn't all that. He's still funny, and the voice alone is a staple to his character. I have the robot now, and I intend to destroy them on national television. A tier. Now, Krang was in the 2000s. 2003 show, but it was a brief cameo while the rest of their race was called the Utrom. And they were actually pretty reliable allies to the Turtles, outside of that one bastard who would definitely be the school shooter at Krang High. I'm not exactly sure how to rank these guys since I already discussed Corel and they weren't actually that evil, so I'm gonna make another tier specifically for them. The 2012 Krang are when the entire species just started to all be known as the Krang, and they were also back to being villains and were a constant technological threat to the Turtles. However, over time, these Krang became less and less threatening and more of an inconvenience in later seasons. Plus, whenever you took away their bodies, it was usually a wrap. I mean, at least we got to see Gilbert Godfrey crying. Never. I'll never tell. <sighs> then it's time for a little torture. Rest in peace, my guy. C tier. Rise TMNT Krang. Oh my god, you are not ready for Rise TMNT Krang. These motherfuckers are borderline diabolical. Not only are they still dangerous even without their suits, not only are they able to zap the turtle's mystic powers away, not only are they able to possess and manipulate other organisms, but they're not even brains anymore. They're kind of built like Minecraft creepers, to be honest. But rest assured, these Krang will have you questioning why your pants are suddenly five pounds heavier. These are without a doubt the best Krang in all of TMNT. They do get their mechs by the end of the movie, which not only look raw as hell, but it's easy to see why Rai Schroeder was as powerful as he was. Because look at what what this guy is able to do. And one detail that I adore that a lot of people miss was the fact that Sister Krang is very reminiscent of the 2012 version, while the Brother Krang was more like the 80s Krang, and then there's the main Krang, the final boss, that very much acts like Utrom Shredder. These Krang are in a league of their own, and yes, they may not have a lot of motivation behind what they do, but trust me, they succeed in so many other areas, and characters like this do not need to be written that deep. They're just the right amount of evil and interesting at face value. S tier. And just in case you're wondering where I would rank the versions I didn't have much to say about, there you go. Well, that took fucking eons to edit and complete, but don't think for a second we're even close to done, because before we go over everything else, we must rank one of the most important parts of the Ninja Turtles, the theme songs. Oh yeah, we're going there. I don't know what I did to deserve growing up watching this show, but I got to experience all the others, so I guess I can't complain that much. This song is ass. I like the sound of this one better, and no, I'm not elaborating further. Tales of the TMNT is a strange one. I dig the spy aesthetic since this season was supposed to be like a bonus DLC pack with these new Elseworld stories, but compared to the OG intro, I'm just not a fan of the instrumental, and I much prefer an intro that gets you hyped as opposed to this one where it's kind of mellow. I know a lot of people may disagree, and it could very much be the nostalgia goggles, but I've always really liked the fast forward theme. True, the lyrics aren't exactly all that, but eh, I like it. 
The Red Sky theme was when the series took a darker turn and the intro was revamped with the new rock song, and even integrated bits of the live action movie. I really like this one, it's not as good as the original and the live action segments are a bit strange, but it's still a great and memorable theme. Rise of the TMNT's intro is fucking nuts. The entire intro is animated in one take and it is gorgeous. I was wondering how they would come up with new lyrics, but I really liked what they did here. It's short and to the point, even Shredder was later added instead of Draxum. True, the melody is the same as the original, but regardless, this intro is a banger and there's also an extended version if you haven't seen it. What can I say about the 2003 theme? I'm not separating the revamps with the different voice lines because if it's the same song, I'm not separating it. But yeah, this theme has everything. Great energy, great lyrics, great animation, and constantly got updated as the story progressed. All around amazing intro. One, two, three, four, three Now, I wouldn't be surprised if this theme got some people to give this show a chance, because the TMNT are no strangers to having rap music in their movies, and these verses are straight up flames. One of the best parts of the 2012 show, no doubt. I love this one. I don't think I should have to explain myself, but I guess I will anyway. Back to the Sewer is a very mixed bag, but they made one of the hardest TMNT songs ever for no reason. Everything from the instrumental to the vocals are fucking gas. I much prefer the extended version where it makes the intro sound even better, and my favorite part is always when he says, Roll Call! This theme song is a certified hood classic, and I'll never get tired of it. Wow, the original is number one? Who could have seen that coming? I had to, alright? This theme is one of the most iconic of its generation, and still sounds great to this day. My favorite rendition is easily the one from Shredder's Revenge. Is this a safe first pick? Of course it is, but believe me, I wouldn't have put it here if I didn't love it. You just can't beat it, I'm sorry. Okay, this is without a doubt the longest video I've ever made, and frankly, I'm exhausted. So let's cut this shit and get to what everyone wants to see. My final ranking of the TV shows. And just so everyone is very clear, this is going going to be a simple, no bullshit, nuts to butts ranking. There's no tallies, and I'm not taking points from the character rankings just because of how much it varies, and most importantly, there's no bias whatsoever. Believe it or not, I grew up with all of these shows at one point or another. Rise was a different story, but I managed to finish that show very quickly because of how short it is. Alright, let's finish this. God, I'm tired. <laughs> Ninja Turtles The Next Mutation is a TV anomaly that to this day I can't believe even made it to one season. It's a goofy kid show made with all the worst parts of Ninja Turtles 3, the Power Rangers, and with even less budget. The only thing this show actually managed to achieve in its entire lifespan was a crossover with the Power Rangers, but I've never seen it so I can't really talk about it. This was actually going to be Ninja Turtles 4 believe it or not, but after things happened, we somehow ended up with this. This is also the show where it has the only official adaptation of a fifth and female turtle named Venus. And you'll never guess what kind of character traits she has, such as woman. And since they're blood siblings, you would think that's where they would draw the line and make Mikey put his dick away. Wishful thinking. We're not brothers. Wait, what the fuck? Did you guys seriously not make them siblings just so you could have Venus get with one of the turtles? You're a full-fledged mutant hottie. <laughs> I cannot recommend this to any living, breathing person. It's got some funny shit in it for sure, but 9 times out of 10 it's unintentional and very poorly written. Uh... There's no April, no Casey, Shredder looks like a sex offender in his pajamas, and I think the action speaks for itself. <laughs> Giddy up, dragon! <laughs> so obviously what I'm trying to say is it's a masterpiece. Okay, listen, this show and its icon status cannot be understated. TMNT 1987 is what introduced most Lifetime fans to the Turtles in the first place, and even introduced ideas that would become major staples in the franchise, like the different colored bandanas and a ton of memorable villains and side characters. It's mainly meant to be a comedy, and while I wouldn't say it holds up tremendously, some of the jokes here are still gold. Everybody hates me! No, little dude! Honest! Hold on, hold on. I, I hate him. 
This show started out as a comedy series with a lot of action, which I think they did just fine considering it was meant to be a kids program and they couldn't exactly use a ton of material from the comics because of how dark they really were. But this was also one of the biggest reasons Eastman himself has openly said he's not a fan of the show because over the course of the series run, it just started to become a full on comedy with the turtles using their weapons less and less and turning villains like Shredder into complete jokes. However, later on, this series got a revamp often referred to as the Red Sky Arc, much akin to when Batman the Animated Series got a makeover. The turtles were now much more serious and the tone was much darker with a lot less, you know, MCU humor where they feel the need to crack a zinger after everything that happens. This shift was not bad by any means and I honestly respect them for trying to stay more true to the Turtles origin. The problem was that those changes were so drastic coming off the previous seasons that they actually ended up losing fans because of it. I'm not sure why, I mean I ate this shit up as a kid, but I can see why some people would get turned off by it because it's almost a complete 180 from what they were used to, which would be something that every future TMNT project would do its best to avoid by combining the silliness of the 80s cartoon with darker and more dramatic themes, which is what ended up making the original movie so successful and why the next two, not so much. This show is very much a product of the 80s. It was meant for nothing more than to sell toys, and if I'm being completely real, almost every major aspect of the show has been outdone by later iterations. In terms of comedy, in terms of emotion, in terms of action, in terms of tone, and in terms of animation. But that still does nothing to change the fact that it's what jumps started the turtles into pop culture and why I'm talking to you guys right now. Hey, Joey! I got some stuff you just gotta try. What is it? Pop. Yeah. You got it. Let's see if Joey's that smart. Huh? I'm not chicken. You're a turkey. I can already hear the pitchforks clinging together, so I'm just gonna put this as elegantly as possible. If this show came out perhaps 10, 15 years beforehand, hell, if people actually grew up with this show in the first place, then it wouldn't get even half the hate it gets now. Which, to be fair, I mean, let's face it, everyone born after 2004 is pretty much an NPC anyway, and no, you won't change my mind on that. People hated this show when it was first revealed, including me! because I'm stupid. But guys, trust me, this is a good fucking show. Yes, there is a much heavier emphasis on the comedy than the previous shows, but this is also what some people claim to be the best one, so I digress. And yes, there is a lot of jokes, but it isn't and never was to the level of Teen Titans Go. The differences are made abundantly clear when you actually watch the fucking thing. The biggest difference is that Rise of the TMNT actually does have a lot of heart and it builds up a major storyline in the background like most shows tend to do. It is mainly episodic, but it also helps that well for starters it's actually funny today i am on vacation hence my board shorts the international sign for I'm not a useful member of society. And the characters in this show are so goddamn wholesome, like the brothers do everything together and it makes for some of the best and most memorable episodes. These people care for each other more than anything, whereas in Teen Titans Go, I'm convinced no one actually likes each other. In fact, I go as far as to say it's more comparable to the original Teen Titans. I rewatched that show recently, yes, all of it, and it does the exact same thing. That show is goofy and anime as hell, but it also takes the time to build its characters and set up future events in a compelling and smart way. But oh no, Raph is the size of a refrigerator, so I guess that means the show is unwatchable. Obviously, I do think Teen Titans does it better, but then again, it was also given more than one and a half seasons to work with. How about I put it to you this way? Remember in Turtles Forever where the Turtle Multiverse was confirmed? Why not think of it in the same way people looked at Spider-Verse? If we can have a female Dr. Octopus, then why not a child Baxter Stockman obsessed with gaining clout? Or maybe think of it as a what-if type of deal. Like, what if Leo was a reckless narcissist? What if Donnie was instead a mad scientist with a ton of personality? What if Splinter had, like, the most interesting backstory in his entire existence and became a better teacher as the series progressed? What if April Bro had a teleporting rat mutant. When I first heard of this show, I looked at its name and rolled my eyes because of how generic that title has become. But surprisingly enough, the name actually fits really well. These turtles in Splinter are incredibly incompetent and don't often succeed in their missions, but by the end they're OP as fuck and they literally rise up and perfect their craft. But one of my favorite aspects about this show is its message about being yourself, which I know is generic as hell, but for these turtles, when it comes to stuff like their new powers, you would think that after they get them taken away in the movie or don't use them because they want to be true ninja like in the train episode, they would do the thing where it's like, oh we don't need them because... 
message. But no, they said, fuck that. This shit is fucking cool, and it's what makes us different, and it's by far the most unique and visually appealing aspect of the show. All the turtles are so creative with their powers. I'm sorry, we cannot be friends if you don't think this is badass. And speaking of visuals, even if for some reason you still don't like the art style or the character designs or whatever, you cannot deny that this is the best animation that TMNT have ever been blessed with. And don't think the action is all flash either. Even the choreography is on a completely different level. My only gripes with this show are two things. One, I have no goddamn clue how these mystic powers work. First, they get them from these new weapons. Then at the end of the series, they get broken and they get them back with the power of family and some kind of sacred Hamato power, which for some reason not only gives them the same powers, but also grants them, one, the ability to materialize their old weapons, two, gives Donnie powers when he didn't have a mystic weapon in the first place along with his old wooden bow, and three, new black bands and longer mass tails for Mikey and Donnie, which are all fire as shit, but why? And then, in the movie, Krang takes them away by screaming at them. Then, of course, they get them back by the end of the movie with the power of family and shit, except this time, there's absolutely no Hamato Nimpo or anything. I know they probably couldn't bring it up in the movie, but this just gives me a headache to no end. They're just lucky their powers are so goddamn cool. My final criticism of this show is unfortunately something that just couldn't be helped. The people working on this show said there could have been upwards of three to seven seasons, and instead, we got two seasons with two practically being slashed in half, which resulted in a lot of rushed plot points and characters that did not get properly fleshed out, which perfectly explains this scene right here, which made absolutely no narrative sense as Raph was done dirty for literally no reason. Oh, and Blue, you are the leader now. Wait, what? Now, Leo has shown to be a better tactician than his brothers, but I'm sorry, people act like this was built up way better than it actually was. Me, personally, I wouldn't let that kind of disrespect slide. I'm not exactly sure why Rise didn't do well, but from everything I've seen, Nickelodeon just treated the show like dog shit and practically hid it from the people. There's more to life than SpongeBob Nick, please, for the love of God, move on. I could go on and on and on about this show, which is really funny since I threw it away so easily at first, but this video is already long enough, and just know that I've never been more happy to be so wrong. If this series actually got the time it deserved and was originally planned for, this might have been my favorite one. This series is still insanely underrated. Please watch it. Nickelodeon, Netflix, whoever the fuck, please give it another chance. I need more. The 2003 TMNT are probably held in the highest regard amongst fans, and I can see why. In my opinion, this show has by far the best tone and atmosphere for the Ninja Turtles. It's not too dark to alienate kids, but it's also not as childish as the last series was. This show strikes the perfect balance of action, drama, and humor. Like, I want to make it very clear this show is not edgy. Even in the earlier seasons, there were a lot of goofs and gaffes. Majority of the characters were very well written, and the villains are some of the most recognizable in the Turtles' legacy. They didn't make any major changes to the turtles, the only noticeable difference is the fact they're all different shades of green, and they only have the white eyes except for when they take off their masks. They did try to give them pupils and back to the sewers, but by then everyone was used to the pupilist design, so it just ended up feeling very off. Thankfully, they went back to the white eyes for turtles forever. The character designs all around were perfect for the TMNT, especially in the case of Shredder. He may not have the most character, but again, his design was just too goaded. In terms of action, while it was most certainly a major step up from the 80s show, I'm I'm gonna be honest, the fights don't really hold up that well. Every once in a while, they'll have a great sequence or creative visuals, but compared to the 2012 series and God forbid Rise, the action may not impress you all that much. On the other hand, I have to say the soundtrack or music in this show is fucking top tier. Even some of the sound effects will stick in your head from this, like who can forget that iconic? <laughs> and of course we can't forget about this banger. TMNT 2003 is a great show. It hits most of, if not all, the notes for a good TMNT show. However, it doesn't really stay that way. As after season 5, where it ends with this awesome dragon battle, they wanted to go in a more family-friendly direction, which tell me if this sounds familiar. And that's how we ended up with TMNT Fast Forward and TMNT Back to the Sewers. Now I'm going to make this very clear. I do not hate Fast Forward, and that might be the nostalgia talking, but I still think it had a lot of really cool ideas. And some episodes are still very memorable to me, much like a lot of the new characters that were introduced. Fuck if I can remember their names, but I mean, they looked cool, I guess. But unfortunately, this also ended up alienating a lot of fans, so in the final season, they tried mixing the two worlds together where it took place in NYC with elements from Fast Forward thrown in, and it does not work at all. 
all. Ever since Fast Forward, the animation also took a bit of a nosedive. There's way less shading than before, and the overall style is just completely thrown out the window. I already mentioned the eye changes to the turtles, and I wish it stopped there, but they significantly changed the look of most of the main cast to resemble the 2007 movie, which would explain the logo change and why the turtles' weapons are no longer their distinctive colors. I mean, look at what they did to April. Her design here is a far cry from the earlier seasons. It's also by this point where they were like, fuck, we gotta bring back Shredder, who by the way has been revived like eight times in the series by that point. Not to mention the countless Shredder variants. I'd say all the stuff with Cyber Shredder is probably the most appealing aspect of Back to the Sewers, plus I think the ending is a great send-off. But the more you think about it, you're probably like, how the hell did we get here? This show didn't completely tank, but it also never came back to the quality of the first five seasons. I'm really glad it ended with Turtles Forever, but still, this show did kind of fall off. The only reason it's above rise for me is the fact it actually got to flesh out its ideas, at least when it actually mattered to them. And aside from the last two seasons, it is easily the most comic accurate and badass looking TMNT show of them all. When it came to making this ranking, I wanted to make it as straightforward as possible for the sole purpose that I would never be able to classify or rank different aspects of the show other than the theme songs. For example, I could never pick which series has the best character designs since I love aspects of each one, like Rise with the different turtle species or 2012 with the subtle differences and the fact their eyes go back to being pure white when things get serious. I would never be able to choose which series has the best villains and I most definitely would never be able to say which series has the best action because well, that's just too obvious. But, in terms of which series I think gives you the most bang for your fuck, it would have to be the 2012 show. There are most certainly things I don't like about this show that have been done better in the other versions. And yes, when push comes to shove, I'll always pick 2D over 3D animation. Rise of the TMNT, I think it's great, I love it. But it's only at its best in the episodes when it's focusing on the overarching plot. And even then, the series is so short and so obviously crunching for time in season 2 that it really holds back the show from me. TMNT 2003 has the exact opposite problem, where it feels like it ran for too long and by the end just ended up becoming a mess. 2012, I believe, is the most well-rounded show because there's five seasons and almost everything is wrapped up by the end. Almost everything. Season 5 is sort of a bonus season with a bunch of Elseworld what-if stories, but it's still a good season, my favorite segment being the Mad Max Future story. The first four seasons are all what you would expect from TMNT. Sometimes it's a random monster of the week, sometimes it's a big multi-episode story. It's not as dark as 03, but when this show hits, it hits like a fucking freight train. And by season 4, it all ends with the Turtles' final confrontation with Shredder. Don't get me wrong, Rise's final battle with Shredder is an amazing fight, but I'm sorry, I know the animation is better, but you will never be able to top this fight for me. It is perfect. It has everything. The turtles are wearing all black, it takes place on a rooftop like it always should, fire everywhere, and Leo fucking decapitating Shredder. This is one of my favorite final battles in any show ever ever made. It left me shook, and I'm grateful for it. The emotion and passion in this series is unmatched, like you just cannot beat it in terms of emotional investment. Rise is probably the closest, but so far this series is untouchable in terms of tear-jerking engagement. The fights in this series are also really well animated, like when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand or weapon-to-weapon -weapon combat, this one is easily the best. There are still things I dislike about this show like Donnie, April, and Casey, but you do get used to it, and Casey still has a lot of great lines. This show's cool, but where are the subtitles? I hate dubbed anime. What surprises me as well is that this series also got a lot of hate when it came out, but it ended up being what felt like a best of Turtle series, with almost every single comic or TV character making some sort of appearance, on top of original characters, which is just insane to think about. Overall, I'd say it's the most well-rounded Turtle show that any fan could enjoy. It has almost every single character you could want, great fight scenes, and easily the best storytelling the franchise has ever had. It even ends the same way the 2003 show did, a crossover with the 80s Turtles and including the original voice actors this time, and the older turtles still being complete dunces. It doesn't go for any longer than it needs to, and it wraps up almost everything by the end. Almost everything. I also doubted this one a bit at first, but damn, this one's gonna be hard to beat. Good god, I'm finally done. By this time, I'm completely sick of talking about TMNT, but rest assured, I will look over any future installments, including Mutant Mayhem. Big thanks to anyone watching, and it may seem impossible at this point, but there is still so much Ninja Turtles stuff in video format that I didn't talk about. Like, did you know the 2003 show was originally going to be in CG before they decided against it?
couldn't imagine why. There's some like obscure old as fuck TMNT anime that makes me itchy for some reason, and who could forget the many live action specials released in the 90s when the turtles were at their peak? Like the Christmas special. <laughs> Or the rock band tour. And who could forget their world-renowned appearance on Oprah? Let me ask you this, do you sometimes wish that April was a turtle? <laughs> Oprah, I've been trying to talk her into an interspecies relationship for months now. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> yeah, chill, man. And she won't yeah, bye-bye. At times I recline way back and both stacks with relations To wrap my conversations about the devils we be lacing in the revolution Be enormous how I'm pooping My mind has been in battle since birth That's why I'm puffing hells and juicing Like your man in arms you're pooping Planning my attack on the sounds of water